In the search for meaning, in a reality enshrouded by mystery, there is ever a constant and perpetuating impulse to create boundaries in one's experience and thought processes to manufacture a feeling of safety, security, and consistency against factors of the unknown. To bring about the security, mental and physical repetition of certain manufactured processes fabricate artificial boundaries in life which eventually become ritualistic. This ritualism manifests a type of self-confirmation towards the thoughts and actions that are continuously repeated. Given enough time, this self-confirmation and consistency thus makes the repeated rituals of thought and action seem more familiar and therefore equally more valid. The validation of the mental and physical thoughts and actions becomes an orthodoxy that is held in the greatest esteem by those following the processes, processes which produce these artificial borders against the terrifying effects of that which could be called the unknown. There is security in the familiar, and all things outside of this boundary are often met with fear and trepidation, for they represent the unknown, and in the unknown there is uncertainty and potentially danger. Validation is often produced through conforming others towards one's own orthodoxy, which produces a false sense of verification in one's ideas. The idea of truth very much operates in this manner, whereby the notion of truth is viewed as a democratic process, with the ideas of truth being put upon opposing scales. If more people believe in an idea, it is demarcated as being correct and is deemed as the truth as opposed to the lie that less people believe in. Ergo, more people believe in my true God as opposed to your false God. This same procedure of creating the security of the known is used not just in manufacturing what is called religion, but also when constructing the ideas of politics, nations, commerce, and laws. It could be said that there is most likely not a single area in the human experience that is not touched by this institution of security from the unknown. Every single notion in the human mind held as sacred truth is layered by the mechanisms of protection that serve to insulate the individual from the perceived threat of that which is believed to be correct. This is certainly why institutions that are deemed to be the established authorities of nations are threatened by those who question that authority and where said authority is actually derived from. When the court systems have a witness swear upon the Bible, they are making an indirect statement that their judgment is derived from the biblical God and that this is where their power is also coming from. This, of course, cannot be proven in any capacity. But the control system of it remains in place because of a democratic demand for it. Officialdom becomes nothing more than a weight of opinion by way of command of the majority. The majority as individuals who would like to believe in the sovereignty of their own thinking while simultaneously remaining oblivious that their commands are most likely not their own but simply demands that have been manipulated through an abundance of influence and advertisement Influence, therefore, holds the highest honor in any power structure, since the weight of the majority controls the direction of the flow of power in any circumstance. Is it any wonder why it feels like one is swimming upstream when in disagreement with the direction that society is headed? It is because of this power of influence that the sources of information that reach the most minds must also be controlled and manipulated by those whose intent it is to take humanity in a certain direction. That direction becomes more obvious as the layers of a plan unfold to their point of consummation, which also means that inevitably there is less time to change said direction. Yet, what would a different direction look like, and who would control it? This is the inherent problem which perpetually exists with changes in power structures towards those who would also simply manipulate the direction of the majority to serve their own purposes, outlook, and agenda. 
Change, therefore, ends up looking like more of the same. Ideas such as freedom or justice can be raised up to look like almost anything the imagination can conjure, depending upon how organized the thoughts and actions are of the ones who carry out a plan towards what those concepts are to appear as. This could furthermore be said to be the difference between creativity and intention. Creativity being any kind of potential which is often very random, while intention, on the other hand, has a very distinct and singular course of action. Humanity as a whole could be likened to being a creative force, while those who influentially maneuver its energies could be said to have great intention. When the populace does not work together for itself in a completely unified sense, there are those who have seen this potential and have taken it upon themselves to manipulate it. Conformity of intention ensures its success over chaotic randomness. One of the easiest methods of manipulation to ensure a unified course of action in the human populace is the promise of fortitude and security, especially against the greatest factors of the unknown, such as death. Fear of the unknown, and especially death, is a great motivating force that welds the population together to weed out the factors which may lead to anything in the supposed unknown from being revealed. It is amazing how far the human mind will go in order to do what it takes to cater to the authorities who promise this protection. Thoughts and therefore actions become fixated in singular terms, and those within the populace who do not fall in line with the measures of so-called protection are often ostracized by their peers and told that they do not care for the welfare of others. The more people that conform, the larger the weight of the democratic ideas of protection appears to hold in check, which creates a newly formed institution of ritualized security against the unknown. Are the actions and notions of this institution the truth? Or is it simply another example of a populace maneuvering their actions based upon the fears of their own mortality? Every war that has ever been waged against another tribe or nation has been justified under the same banner. The enemy represents the potential for tyranny and death, and the tribe holding the flag of truth must extinguish that enemy at all costs. It is continuously stated that their very lives are at stake, and along with it the notions of freedom and justice which have been given to them by their authorities. The victor in these wars is always proven to be the correct one, since they get to write the version of truth which goes down in recorded history. Fear wants to be on the side of a sure thing, and the democratic majority represents this, since the minority, at least symbolically, represents a force that equates to less strength. It can be seen that when taken down to the individual level, to stand alone would be equated as the most difficult place to be in. As a point of observation, it is also only the individual that can be a leader, which is something that is worth careful consideration as well. The obvious paradoxical aspect being that it is again the individual that wields the greatest amount of power, for they are tasked with maneuvering the majority. The leader that does the best job in the eyes of the populace at protecting them usually remains in power the longest. This is most likely the very reason that religion has always remained such a powerful and influential force with its promises of protection in the afterlife. The promise is made that in the unknown there is a savior awaiting the individual who will bring them to a place of everlasting peace and kindness. A promise that is made in this reality by those who state that they are the vicars of this symbolic savior figure. Such assurances are, of course, very desirable to the mind that is terrified of uncertainty, especially the uncertainty of things that can never be seen or definitively proven. 
The belief in the promise of salvation seems to be a necessary mental acquisition that quashes this fear, at least on the surface of things. When multitudes of other individuals begin to believe in this same promise, the validation of the belief is perceptually strengthened. A circular mantra of self-assurance can be utilized that there would not be so many followers in a belief if it were not true. Any who question the authority of these types of beliefs are seen as enemies of the perceived state of protection. It makes little to no difference whether this perceived state of protection is held in regards to the afterlife or within this reality. Those who question the state are seen as enemies of it, since the state is about intention. The nonconformist is a rebel that creates a potential hazard or blockade towards the objectives of these powers that have a singular objective in mind. This is easily seen on an individual level within anything that is competitive. The intention is to win, and the competition is simply the object that is getting in the way of that potential victory. What is victory? It is an idea that one has dominated another in their own mind with feelings of superiority and distinction. How then can a human populace, by way of its own volition and without governmental influence, ever work together towards a common objective when there is always so much competition and rivalry amongst itself. It seems quite obvious that it cannot. There are too many variegated ideas about what is right and wrong. Mix in a stew of concepts such as nationalism, racism, religion, political ideologies and prejudice, and the world of humanity is in a state of chaos once more. It can be surmised that no one wants to be in a place of uncertainty, so when there exists a tiny number who are on the same page of intention and understands how to control the chaos by using mental tactics of control which are reinforced through physical protections, then authority is nearly always assured. A rancher protects their cattle up until their final moments, and those cattle always trust their master. The rancher has intent and a purpose of direction, and therefore funnels their own energy and the energies of the cattle towards that intent. Physical protection in whatever capacity leads to mental assurance, which in turn leads to confidence in the known. This same type of assurance can be confirmed in anyone who takes care of a pet, or in the dynamic role of parents with their children. Once this is comprehended, it is not difficult to discern how a very small group is capable of controlling large numbers of people. The inability of the human race to govern itself in a cohesive and systematic manner and thus to be subject to external authority without expiration is expressed in the first paragraphs of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. That force, which is capitalized, is electrical in nature, which is confirmed shortly thereafter. One of the greatest symbols of this force is the monetary system, which represents units of electrical currents, hence currency, along with the aspect of being charged for items and services. Those who wield more units of this symbol hold larger shares of that power through the ability to manipulate the behaviors of the populace how they see fit. It is not by accident again that the word profit and profit are phonetically identical. Those who make the most profits become the profits of the future in this world, for the currency of their intent unfolds the direction of the future, and they become prophets for that reason. This is furthermore why it has always been stated to follow the money, for its direction in large volumes will assuredly indicate the next stages of a plan.
Symbols in this regard afford another level of protection from that psychological nemesis called the unknown, which humanity finds itself perpetually escaping from. A symbol represents an idea, a concept that often indicates that there is a tangible energy that is looking after one's best interests, regardless of what those interests are. At least this is what the minds of the populace have been led to believe. Beliefs can only hold true or seem to be plausible if they are tethered to something, and symbols act as a pillar that support one's notions in something that is altogether too often not inherently comprehended. Symbols, for the public at large, can therefore act as vacuums that are able to be molded and shaped into icons that seem to take on a life force of their own. To disagree with someone's interpretation of a symbol is to become a pariah. These defensive reactions are utilized not because the symbols need to be defended, but because the individuals who have a great deal of emotional and psychological investment in them need constant reassurance. It is the same with anything that is ritualistic or traditional, regardless of the culture one finds themselves in. Many celebrate ritualistic symbolic holidays such as Christmas or Easter and do not have a single iota of knowledge in regards to the deeper meaning behind the symbols of these traditions. It is also the experience of those who no longer choose to participate in such rituals to be treated as outcasts by other members of their communities. It is seen by way of traditions that the religious and secular side of society have far more in common with each other than either side would like to believe. There are hints of the psychological darkness of ignorance diminishing, yet it could possibly also be argued that there are hints of it being more prevalent than ever. Perspective is often a fickle matter. Regardless, there is still much more work to be done. Traditions as a whole do one very important thing for humanity. They represent continuity and assurance that we got it right. To circle the year and repeat an event becomes a physical form of normalcy confirmation. What is normal? That which is not abnormal. What is abnormal? that which is not normal. The contention itself is circular and is simply proven by holding the assertion that I am normal and therefore can decree who and what is abnormal. It is self-autocracy where the lawyers and the judge on the inner courts of the mind are one and the same individual. But who conditioned and molded the mind of the judge? Where did all the ideas about what normal looks like originate? How much of this is simply a pattern of influence and cognitive manipulation? Molded patterns of the mind become like graves, where the mentally buried corpses of perception are mistaken as prized pearls of wisdom, sealed away until their day of resurrection arrives at some random moment in seemingly judicious conversation. It has forgotten that truth can be compared to the seasons of nature, constantly changing and evolving. Only a dead thing is invariable, incapable of adjustment in any regard. This makes its characteristics completely known all of the time and is therefore deemed to be a sure thing, safe in its complete and total consistency. Yet not even an actual corpse stays in the same state for even a moment, as nature's laws are ever at work to rearrange its composition. One form of matter alternates into other forms. The easily observable and ironic paradox is clear. The only thing that cannot change is change itself. In the fight against this, humanity has built for itself multitudes of shrines dedicated to the worship of immutable constructs held up as revered safeguards against the terrifying vagaries of the unpredictable future. A future that continues to force its way into each of us regardless of any belief system we hold against it. It may be stated that nature could be proven to be quite predictable. One season follows the next one, and this goes around in a circle every year. Yet, nature is also very unpredictable with the effects of what those seasons bring, and this makes it very much alive. A dead construct or set of ideas is predictable, but a living force is incalculable. Who knows what creative efforts can be drawn up at any given moment to solve and make it through any situation? 
and knowing this in one's heart provides endless untapped reserves of resilience and also opportunity. When one is stuck on a singular idea or way of doing things, that sets the mind in solid concrete and makes one completely vulnerable to the effects of ulterior forces. The heart does not operate in this manner, as all it sees is abundance and life. The heart is the master of the unknown, something the mind has forgotten and fought against since time began. While the mind was busy building up inventories of fear and the dead, that space inside of us that is linked with the eternal has been the true guide, patiently, endlessly awaiting that creative action which will open the prison doors to this essence within each of us that has been locked away for an eternity. The mind is endlessly chattering for it wants to be the only thing that is listened to and followed. There is, however, a voice far deeper that calls out within each of us. It is far more subtle and less obvious. That deeper voice can only be heard in the silence. One forgets about the silence when believing there is somewhere to go or someone to become. The heart is already completion. Where is there to go? Who is there to become? The cycle repeats itself in an endurance race of regrets. How it has almost altogether been forgotten to be creative for the very sake of creativity itself. Instead, always awaiting the opinions and judgments of others who are also themselves chasing after the same deified idols of glory, fame, riches, and even acknowledgement. The heart is already completion. All it sees is abundance and life and lacks for nothing, as everything is created endlessly from the unknown, which it is the master of. What a world humanity could create if it recognized this. What a universe and multiverse humanity could create if it recognized this. If only humanity could recognize this. Again.